I'm not patient. I've never been. I remember once I was playing with my daughter, she's two years old, and we were trying to do a jigsaw puzzle together. But I got so frustrated waiting for her to find the right position and orientation of each piece that I just started doing the puzzle myself. And I remember my husband, he looked at me quite shocked, and then he said to her, it's okay, just let mom play, <laughs> then I will play with you. So, if you're that type of deeply impatient person, you're like this also in your work. I have the urge to get things done. If I start doing something, I cannot stop just because it's the end of the day. But sometimes in life, I've learned, you have to be patient. Because sometimes you have to face challenges that they just cannot be solved by the end of the day. You know, almost six years ago, I moved to Norway because the Norwegian Public Road Administration asked me if I wanted to be involved in one of the largest and most futuristic transportation projects in the world, the coastal highway route E39. This road stretches 1,100 kilometers along the west coast of Norway, and it crosses 10 fjords. And the only way to cross seven of those 10 fjords is, even nowadays, by ferry. It takes 21 hours to cross those 1,100 kilometers to drive those kilometers. 21 hours. It means 50 kilometers per hour, you know, for a road that should simplify the life of people living there, that should improve the transport efficiency for the national economy. More than 50% of the national export is produced in that area. This is simply unacceptable. So, why not to build some bridges? This could be an idea. Maybe, maybe suspension bridges. Even if some of these fjords are really long, around four, six kilometers. So a traditional suspension bridge would not be a feasible solution. Maybe a tunnel, an undersea tunnel. Even if some of these fjords are also really deep, so a tunnel would be too long. We should think about something else. I know. Floating bridges or, or suspension bridges on floating towers. Why not? This could be a solution. Even if some of these fjords are also really exposed to the environmental actions like wind, waves, currents, and these bridges are naturally exposed to those actions. We should find another solution. Wouldn't it be perfect to have a submerged bridge, but floating? The submergence would help us to reduce the main sea load on the structure, like waves, for example. And it also helps us to take advantage of the Archimedes lifting force that every submerged body has to counterbalance the vertical load of the structure. A hidden bridge. That's genial. No visual impact on the landscape. No acoustic pollution on the surroundings. No interference with migratory path of birds. A submerged floating tube bridge, or we call it also SFTB. I fell in love with this structure. And that's why when I discovered that this was one of the solutions to cross some of these fjords, I had to accept the invitation to lead the feasibility studies on it. But this is not a new structure, you know? This structure has a long history. And this is a story that I want to tell you today. A story of an old idea, 
and the story of a new technology, but also the story of all the people, all the engineers that have brought this structure with them through the last century. This guy is our first character. His name was Sir Edward James Reed. We are in 1886, and he was an English naval architect. He patented a solution for the SFTB, for the railway crossing. The first Norwegian character arrives in 1923, Trygve Olsen, a Norwegian engineer. He also patented a solution for the SFTB, but to see the SFTB proposed for a specific crossing, we have to wait until 1947. Erik Odegård is our fighting knight. He was a Norwegian engineer, working for the Norwegian Public Road Administration, and he would spend his life promoting and fighting for this structure. He would not succeed. This is the Karmsund crossing, where Odegård proposed an SFTB for the first time. It would not succeed. This was the bridge that was constructed in 1955. You know, one of uh, Odegaard's sentences has become a famous quote. He used to say that we have to evaluate everything, okay, everything in a realistic way, and not from the easy principle that everything and everything uh, known is safe, and everything unknown is dangerous. He was right. But this was the fate of the SFTB in those years. Tunnels and bridges, especially suspension bridges, were constructed instead of the SFTB. Well, Odegaard admitted that there were some shortcomings in the technological development especially related to the connection of the structure with the seabed and the marine operation. In 1969, Odegaard convinced the Public Road Administration to create a committee to evaluate the SFTB as a real feasible solution for the future of the traffic system. 1969, remember this date, because in the same year, Ecofisk was discovered. But to explain to you what Ecofisk is and why this is part of our story, I have to make a step back in time. It's 1958, and a commission of, uh, well, let's say experts, stated in an official document that there was no possibility at all of finding oil in Norway. Experts, yes. Nevertheless, in 1962, the Philips Petroleum asked the Norwegian government for the exclusive right to explore the Norwegian shelf. The Norwegian government answered one year later. In an official document, they stated that an eventual reservoir in Norway was property of Norway, and just the parliament could release the specific licenses and this is what they did in 1965. 22 licenses that you can see here were released. In 1969, Ecofisk, the first, and one of the biggest reservoirs in Norway was discovered. It's the beginning of the oil era for Norway. The production started in 1971. In the same year, the Commission of Experts concluded its report. The structure is certainly interesting, they wrote. But the technology to build it is not ready yet. But that technology was developing really fast, and they knew. After the gravity-based platforms, the first TLP was constructed in 1980 in Scotland. The first TLPs in Norway were installed in the 90s, Snøre, and Heydrun. Those elements, the tethers connecting structures with the seabed, are the same elements that nowadays we propose for one of the solutions of the SFTB. All that 
technological buzz and swarm infused confidence and enthusiasm in the scientific community. And many proposals were done for the SFTB all around Japan, Norway, China, Switzerland, also Italy proposed some solution for the SFTB. In 1969, Grant made a proposal for the SFTB to cross the Messina Strait. That project was then evaluated by some scientific society. And then, in 1987, ENI did a study on it. But the project was finally abandoned for a proposal of a suspension bridge. We have Odegaard's sentence in our head, isn't it? It is continuously marking the path of this structure, known technology instead of a new one. But the Italian project was never realized. And nowadays, they are starting to discuss it again. And it seems that the SFTB will still have some chances. Another project in Italy was proposed in 1984 for Como Lake. Gianfranco Magrini, an Italian visionary engineer, sketched a solution to solve the traffic problems around the lake shores. This is fantastic because this project is so relevant even nowadays. But none of this proposed SFTB was ever realized. The turning point for the SFTB arrived with the E39 Fjord Crossing project in Norway. In 2013, the Norwegian government inserted the crossings along the E39 in the National Transport Plan, a governmental white paper. And since then, since 2013, floating bridges, suspension bridges on floating towers, and our hero, the submerged floating tube bridge were developed with several feasibility studies. The SFTB we propose to cross the Norwegian fjords are robust structure. They are able to withstand unexpected situation. And they are able to create a hidden bridge and leave the beauty of the Norwegian fjords untouched. Yeah, like tunnels. Oh no. They're not like tunnels, you know, floating just below the sea surface. They are able to shorten the crossing. And in addition, do you know that sensation of driving into a subsea tunnel? Yes. Just forget it. <laughs> there is no big slope entering and at the exit of the tunnel. So why this structure hasn't been built yet? Well, some hybrid structure have been built, but no SFTB with tethers or pontoons. I can still hear Odegaard's sentence. But are we in the same situation? No. No, we're not. The technology developed in the 80s has nowadays 40 years of maturity, and we can finally rely on it. And all the work done by the Norwegian Public Road Administration with all the study and all the research has finally demonstrated the feasibility of this structure. The SFTB is nowadays proposed for free crossings along the E39 in Norway. And I really hope that Norway, after investing all this effort, will be the first country to build it. But we will see. There are many countries, you know, like Korea and China and many others that have started to think about dissolution again. Times have changed, dear Odegaard. We are entering into a new era where the SFTB is nowadays a real feasible solution for the traffic system. We really believe that the scientific knowledge that has been reached in the last years is everyone's heritage. And that's why we are continuously disseminating, sharing our experience all around the world. And that's also why we have worked with an international group of experts to the first international guideline for this structure. And this document has been presented this year in September in Madrid. We really think that the SFTB, the Submerged Floating Tube Bridge, will have a key role 
in our future of growing population and lack of available space on land. You know? <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> um, I have learned many things in the last years, I have to say it. But the most important thing I've learned is that sometimes you have to be patient. Because the greatest achievement is not when you have finished your work. The greatest achievement for me, for you, is in the path itself. And I have finally understood what Kavafis says in his poetry, Itaka. You have to hope that the journey will be long and rich in experience. And at the end, when you reach Ithaca, you will finally understand the gift that Ithaca gave to you, because Ithaca's gift was the journey. <laughs>